started looking this morning at the uh, principle we find in several passages, uh, much more so in the Old Testament, of course, than the New Testament. In Psalm 119, verse 104, and uh, other passages, we find statements to the effect of uh, things that we're supposed to hate. Uh, hating every false way is what we've uh, titled the theme of the lessons today. <coughs> this morning, we talk about uh, what to hate. And we notice that, obviously, text says we're supposed to hate every false way. That is, if it isn't in uh, harmony with God's will, then we're supposed to hate that. We're supposed to hate the works of the apostate, those who depart from the truth. The things that they do in their departure from the truth of God's word, we're supposed to hate those works. And we notice uh, there are even passages, both in Old Testament and New Testament. We notice uh, the last passage that we looked at this morning in uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 26, that uh, Jesus even talked about occasions when uh, we have to hate people. And we, of course, explain from that that uh, that's not using the word hate in the sense of malicious intent. That's typically what people are uh, talking about when they refer to hate or, you know, uh, we hear someone, you know, say something to the effect of why are you hating? Why are you hating on me? All right. Well, it, it, it basically means why are you being malicious to me? Why are you being hurtful to me? Why, why are you trying to hurt me? Right? That's, that's what that typically means or how it's typically used. Well, when the Bible talks about hating the person. Now, of course, we, we understand that, that uh, there are things that we hate, every false way, the work works of those who, who uh, depart from God, the, the works of uh, apostasy. Of course, that's emphasizing the things that we're supposed to hate, the, the things like uh, violence and, and uh, 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 maliciousness and bribery and covetousness and uh, all of those things that are the works of the flesh, sinfulness. We're supposed to hate worldliness, essentially. And, and we understand the idea of hating the things. Uh, but then we look at those passages that talk about hating people, and sometimes that may give a confusing idea but it's in the same sense as hating the thing, meaning that we, we don't desire it, we don't like it, we don't want it, we don't want to be around it, we avoid it. As we, we look at that definition of the word hate that Jesus used in Luke chapter 14, uh, it means to have an aversion to that. That is, it repulses me. I don't want to be around it. All right? So that's how the word hate is being used. So, so hating every false way basically means having an aversion to it. If it's a false way, if it, if it is contrary to the will of God, I don't want to be around it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want to uh, stay away from it. So this evening, uh, since we, we talked about what to hate this morning, <clears throat> we need to spend some time talking about how to hate. Because just like with the word love, the world has made a terrible, terrible mess out of what it means to hate and how hate is expressed. According to the world, the only way to express hate is with malicious intent to do someone harm. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not how the Bible uses the word hate. Just like it's not how the Bible uses the word love. To, to uh, say that, that the only way to express love is to tolerate and make somebody feel good about whatever choices they make. Somebody will, will be engaged in some gross immorality, what the Bible very clearly refers to as abominable and immoral. And they'll say something to the effect of, well, if God loves me, they'll want me to be happy. Well, God does love you, and He does want you to be happy. He wants you to be happy doing His will. He wants doing His will to be what makes you happy. And when we understand that His will is good for us, 
It's beneficial for us to, to keep His precepts, to follow His will. As we read this morning in uh, Psalm 119 and 104 and Psalm 119 and 128, that it's the precepts of God that give us our understanding. It's the precepts of God that we understand to be beneficial for us, and so we want to keep those things. Well, according to the world, the only way to express love is to just tolerate anything anybody wants to do. That's not love. Well, neither is it hate, or the only way to express hate is to show malicious intent towards somebody. And so we want to talk about how to hate. Because sometimes it is the appropriate response, sometimes it is the uh, 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 right thing to do to express hatred for uh, a thing or a person for where they are in their conduct. And so we looked at that this morning. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. There, uh, uh, therefore all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. There's a time uh, to love and a time to hate. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 8. So. Again, we want to uh, answer the question, well, how do I express hatred for these things, for every false way, for the uh, works of those who depart from the Lord, uh, for uh, evil people? How do I express that, that hate? Well, first of all, through, as the psalmist said, through his precepts. Right? Isn't that what the psalmist said? When the psalmist said, uh, I will hate every false way, it says, therefore, I will hate every false way. Well, what's the therefore? Because I love your precepts, because I, 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 I understand that, that your precepts give wisdom, because I understand that about your precepts, I'm going to hate anything that isn't in harmony with your precepts. So that presupposes that to hate every false way, we have to know what the right way is. So the way that we, we express hate or the way that we, we hate every false way is by knowing what the good way is. If, if, it, if there's a false way, then there's a true way. And the psalmist says, I get understanding through your precepts. I understand your precepts. Therefore, I will hate every false way. So the, 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 the first thing that has to be done for us to hate every false way, for us to hate the works of those who depart from the Lord, for us to hate evil people in their wickedness, for us to do that, we have to know the precepts of the Lord. Uh, we, we make that point a lot of times from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 where the Apostle Peter says uh, to always be ready to make a defense for the hope that is in you. Or, or be ready to give an answer as the King James says that. Uh, the, the word answer there, as we've talked about before, is the Greek word apologia. It's where we get the English word apology. And just like... The, just like the world has messed up the, the word love and the word hate, it's messed up the word apology too. Because now the only way we think of apology is, is to say, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Well, that is an apology, but that's not what an apology is. An apology is making a defense, making your case. It's actually a legal word. Talking about how a warrior makes their case to be judged on. And so when he says, uh, always be ready to make a defense for the hope that is in you, the meekness and fear. Well, the only way we can do that is to know why we believe what we believe. That's the only way we can make a defense for the hope that is in us. Why do you believe you're going to heaven? Well, I don't know. I just feel it in my heart. No, that's not making a defense for anything. That's just uh, telling people how you feel. That's one of the big problems with with especially our current culture, is this, this emotional reasoning where, where all of our reasons, all of the, the, the reasons that we, we believe certain things are based in emotions. That's called emotional reasoning. Right? And so how do you know that this is true? Well, I feel it. Or well, I feel, when, when, when I hear this, it makes me feel this way. Well, so... One of the, one of the uh, uh, talk 
show host or one of the commentators uh, that I enjoy listening to has a kind of a catchphrase that he's well known for. And he says, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> facts, and isn't that the truth? Facts, if it is a fact, then it's true regardless of how you feel about it. Isn't that, isn't that what we say a lot of times when we're studying the Bible with people? And, and, and uh, uh, somebody is using emotional reasoning and basing what they believe on, on their emotions. And, and uh, we, we'll make a comment to the effect of, well, this is what the Bible says. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It, it, you, you might not like what it says. You know, if, if, if you are a liar and you read where the Bible says that all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, you're not going to like that. Well, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It still says all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, Revelation 21. That's, what it, that's the fact of what it says. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It's the problem with the bumper sticker that, that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That is not right. That's emotional reasoning. That, that is, that is uh, this idea that if I accept it, well, then that makes it true. If, if, if I feel like it's true, well, then that makes it true. No, it's true whether you like it or not. God said it. That settles it. Now I have to believe it. Right? So... <clears throat> Before we can hate every false way, we have to know what the true way is. We have to be diligent students of God's Word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Workers who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It, it amazes me sometimes having discussions with people or, or listening to what people are saying about the Bible. And, and you know, I, I do the program on Monday night. And uh, over the past three, four weeks especially, there's been a couple of different people that have used some, some uh, I, it's hard to even call it reasoning. It's hard to even call it uh, making an argument. But, but they, they've said things about what the Bible teaches or what they believe the Bible teaches that just is completely irrational. It doesn't make any sense at all. And when you show it to them, when you try to, when you try to respond to what they, what they believe with, with the facts of what the Bible says, they act like you're being hateful to them for some. You know, they, they act like you're, you're, you're trying to, to hurt them somehow. They don't know what the Bible says. And that's why they don't know that what they're espousing is a false way. If they knew what the Bible said, if they understood what the Bible... Now, when I say they don't know what the Bible says, I, I don't mean by that that they don't know what the words on the page are. All of us can open our Bibles and read the words on the page. And we should be reading our Bibles every day. We should be very familiar with the words on the page. But that's, that's not what knowing what it says means. Knowing what it says doesn't just mean that we know what the words on the page are. Knowing what it says means that we study it. We, we understand the application of it. And, and it's, it's sad. The level of biblical ignorance in our society. Especially when you look back over the history of this country. And you know, go back sometime, if you can do it, uh, and, and read, for example, letters that were written by Civil War soldiers from the battlefield. And they were writing letters back home to their families. And you, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, stricken by a couple of things probably. First of all, their exquisite penmanship. I mean, these are these are, 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 are typically poor, uneducated farmers. And yet they've got better penmanship than a lot of college professors today. I mean, their penmanship is just beautiful. Not only that, their vocabulary and their biblical understanding. As they're writing back to their families, they're, I mean, they're out there. They don't have their, they don't, 
they, they, didn't, they couldn't run to the drugstore like we can. We can run up to Walgreens and CVS and grab a Bible off the shelf. We can run up to Walmart and grab a They couldn't do that. They had their family Bibles at home, typically. They, they, they typically didn't have Bibles in their pocket out in the field. And yet these letters they're writing back home, they're quoting Scripture after Scripture after Scripture and making correct application of it, typically. Now, you know, granted, they... Uh, believe in a lot of denominational doctrine, and, and that's in their letters also. But, but just the, the level of biblical literacy that they had. These, like I said, typically uneducated farmers. And yet they're out there just quoting verse after verse after verse in their letters. <coughs> Making, uh, uh, telling their parents or their, their wife, or their, their children, or whoever they're writing to. They, using biblical passages to explain to them what it's like for them out in the, out in the battlefield. How, how, many, <laughs> how many of us could do that? We, we have more availability to more knowledge now than at any other time in human history. At, at, at the, I don't have my phone in my pocket, which is a good thing. I, you know, I, I shouldn't. But, you know, I've got my tablet here. I could go on my tablet and find, find information on just about any question I wanted to study. Just go and, and have access to the libraries of the world and find almost any information I wanted to. We have more access to more knowledge easier than any time before in human history. And yet, generally speaking, people know less than at any other time in human history. It, it, it would seem like the, the, the greater availability of knowledge would lead to people knowing more stuff. But it's not. There, there are some remarkably amazing videos on YouTube. I love YouTube. That's about the only TV I watch is YouTube. I love it. But I'm watching people like uh, Jordan Peterson and, and Sam Harris and uh, 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 Ruben, whatever, the, what, I can't remember his name now, Ruben Report, whatever. And it's, I mean, it's just amazing stuff, great stuff, just filled with information. But you go, don't do it. I'm not telling you to do it. You go to the trending tab on YouTube, and what's trending? People eating Tide Pods. So here you've got the, the very same platform that offers all of this amazing wisdom, all of this amazing information, and what's trending? The most ridiculous stuff you can imagine. That's a problem. People don't know the false way. They don't know how to hate every false way because they don't know the right way. Before we can hate the false way, we have to know the right way. We have to, to know his precepts so that we know that anything that disagrees with that, anything that is contrary to that, we're, we're supposed to hate it. We're supposed to, to uh, 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 have an aversion to it. We're supposed to, to, to uh, uh, keep it away from us. Well, we, we don't know. You know, rat poison has something in it that's attractive to the rat. Otherwise, the rat would need it. And so the rat doesn't know that there's something in there that if it eats that, it's going to kill it. If it did, it wouldn't eat it. Now, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say rats have the ability to reason these things out, but we do. And yet we still eat the rat poison. So, how do we hate? Well, we have to know the right way before we can hate every false way. Notice how, how Jesus emphasizes that. You, you remember we looked at, at Luke uh, uh, 14 and verse 26. I believe it's verse 26. Uh, where Jesus
Jesus said that unless a person hates father and mother, uh, son and daughter, uh, that he can't follow him. Let me read it again. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We talked, that was the last passage we looked at this morning. This is the, the parallel to that in, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. And right before now, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, unless you love me more. He doesn't, he doesn't use the word hate. Luke uses the word hate. Matthew uses the term love me more. Right? Uh, and that's where people get the idea that in Luke 14, he's talking about uh, uh, we have to, that the word hate there means love less. Well, no, it doesn't. It means, it means hate. Uh, but they get the idea from the parallel. That that's what it means. Because here he says, look, you have to love me more. Right? But, but just prior to Jesus saying that, he says this, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Well, I thought that the shepherds in the field said peace on earth would go man. Well, they did. To those that love the Lord. Right? To those that love the Lord, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He, he brings peace between us and God. He brings peace between all of us who love the Lord. We, we live in a, in a wonderful state of fellowship with God, and because we're in fellowship with God, we're in fellowship with one another. And in that sense, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He makes that peace possible, and it's only through Jesus that that peace is possible. But he says here, in a different context, talking about a different principle, he says here, do not think that I came to bring peace. That is, if, if we think that the gospel is going to create peace between everyone, we're, we're kidding ourselves. It is not. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And then he says right after this, basically because of this, you have to love me more than them. Right? Now what's he talking about when he, when, when he refers to the sword there? He says he did not come to bring peace. He's talking about his doctrine. As we, we parallel that back with, with Psalm 119 and uh, uh, passages that we looked at, hating every false way. And the psalmist says... I have loved your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Well, that's the, the sword that Jesus is talking about here, is his precepts, his law, the gospel. And so what is it that will cause the division that will set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law? What is it that will make a man's enemies those of his own household? It's the gospel. Because it will divide us from those who follow false ways. It will, by, by, by understanding and applying the gospel, we will uh, have an aversion to, to those who don't follow the gospel. And if that's those of our own household, then that's what the gospel does. In other words, it doesn't matter who it is. We... We can't justify uh, rejection of the gospel. We can't justify lifestyles that are a false way, that are contrary to the gospel, that are contrary to the precepts of God. We can't justify that by saying, uh, well, it's my dad, or it's my daughter, or it's my wife, or whatever. We, we, we can't justify it by saying, well, you know, it's my family. Well, that doesn't change the fact that they're following a false way, and I'm not supposed to, to uh, be in agreement with that. Now, that's, <laughs> that's not to say that parents aren't supposed to, to take care of their children, that children are not supposed to honor their parents if their parents aren't, aren't obeying the gospel. That's not what that's talking about. But there's going to be friction there. There's not going to be unity there. There's, there's not going to be fellowship there because we hate every false way. Because we're following the gospel. So, how do we hate? 
by knowing the precepts of God and, and, and having a commitment, having a resolve to stick to them. Now, what is applying this principle going to cause us to do? I don't want to live in a household where, where there's division. I don't want to live in a household where, where my enemies are living with me. I don't want that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can. I'm going to do everything in my power to create the kind of unity in my house that can only come from the gospel. It means I want my wife to be faithful. It means I want my kids to be faithful. If my mom and dad is living with me, I want them to be faithful because I want harmony in my house. This is a miserable condition to live in. But, if we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and they don't, it's the way we're going to live because of our commitment to Christ. It's not our fault that somebody else rejects the gospel. And that, that, that takes us on to the next point of how to hate. Well, we have to know the precepts of God so we can, we can distinguish between the false way and the right way. And, and, and we have to be committed to that right way. And then we have to expose the error. Right? In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul says there, and have no fellowship. Now, I don't care how many ways you say it, no means zero. You, if, uh, there, there's a question in, in the... Uh, in the Bible study, I like to use when I'm studying with people, this uh, uh, introduction to faith uh, Bible study. One of the questions in there is what is the numeric value of, you know, whatever the question is. And, and the answer is zero. Well, if I were to ask the question, what is the numeric value of no? The numeric value of no is zero. It means none. Zip, zilch, zero, right? And have no, zero fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And we, we can't stop there. The, the, the statement does not stop there. It says, but, right? That's a contrast. So in contrast to having fellowship with it, what are we supposed to do? We're not supposed to have any fellowship with it, so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to expose it. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So darkness and secret are parallel terms. That's what people in the dark are... The reason they're doing it in the dark is because they want it to be secret. Okay? So he says it's shameful even to speak. That's like the term, uh, don't even eat with them, right? To that extent. Well, it's wrong to have fellowship with these uh, works of darkness, even to the degree of even speaking of it. Even talking like we're in agreement with it. Right? So not even to speak of it, basically. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed, so you got exposed them, exposed, are made manifest by the light. The light, of course, is the gospel, God's word. For whatever makes manifest is light. Now notice that last term. Whatever makes manifest is light. Makes what manifest? Uh, error, the, the unfruitful works. Okay, so just like he says, uh, I will hate every false way. Well, every false way there is unfruitful works. So if you're, if you're talking about unfruitful works and the light that exposes those things to be unfruitful works, well, then what is that light? Uh, it's the gospel. So whatever makes manifest, just like the, the psalmist talks about every false way, well, the only alternative to every false way is the right way. Well, the same thing here. The only alternative to the unfruitful works of darkness is the light. That is God's Word, the Gospel. So whatever makes manifest, whatever exposes these things to be the error that they are, it is light. So now how do we do that? We live it, right? We, we take the Gospel, 
We, we, we rightly divide the Word of God. We make the correct application of it. We live it in our lives so that when we are in a place, we are like a light that is shining in that place. And if there are things that are trying to be hidden in the darkness in that place, the light that we shine, that is the truth, will expose those things to be error. That's why the world persecutes Christians, because uh, those that are trying to hide in the dark don't like to have the light turned on. So what do they do? They want to put out the light. I love that word, expose there. It, it, it's, uh, sometimes it's translated reprove or rebuke or convict. It's this word that Loa Nita defines as to state that someone has done wrong. So it's not just to have no fellowship with it, it's to point out that it's wrong. So not only am I not going to participate in it, but here's why. Right? To state that someone has done wrong with the implication that there is adequate proof of such wrongdoing. Right? And I know you've heard me say before that if, if you hear me say something that's wrong, come tell me. But you, you need to come with some proof. Because I've done my stuff. So if I'm, if I'm wrong, I want to know. I want you to tell me. I want you to expose it. But it's going to take some proof. Because I don't get up thinking I'm wrong when I get up. Right? So if I'm wrong, I do need to know that. And you would be doing me a favor to tell that. But don't just come like like happens so often. Well, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. Okay. Would you care to talk about that? No, I just don't agree with you. All right, you can be wrong if you want to. That's up to you, right? If, if, if you think I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. I want you to. You would be doing me a favor by showing me that I'm wrong. But now, when we do this, to state that someone has done wrong, when we do that, what is the immediate reaction to that? Hate speech. Hate speech. You're using hate speech. Right? The, the, the way that you're living is wrong. Hate speech. That thing that you are engaged in is a sin. Hate speech. In Canada, they can bring you up between a... a, a, a you can, they, they can bring you up before a human, a human rights tribunal. Because you, 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 you have stated that something they're doing is wrong. That has hurt their feelings. That has offended them. And in Canada, they've outlawed offense. They've made it illegal to offend somebody. And if you don't think that's coming here, you're not paying attention. That is coming here. So that if the wrong people get in charge and are able to pass the laws that they want to pass, they will make it against the law to say anything offensive. Do you think that there are those that when they hear you say, or even just read what Romans chapter 1 says, when they hear you say that homosexuality is a sin, that they would charge you with hate speech? Well, sure they would. Or when you say that... that uh, 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 Sexual relations outside of marriage is a sin. That there are those who would who would want to uh, have you prosecuted for hate speech for saying that. Well, sure there is. Or any any number of things that 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 someone would would say. Well, that offended me. When you said that, that offended me. And because it offended me, I want you to be punished. Because hate speech. That, that's the whole idea behind hate speech legislation. Now, I don't know about you. I, I, I would hope that, that we're uh, of the same mind on this. But I don't care what a person says. I don't care how ugly and nasty and terrible what a person says is. I don't care what names they call me. I don't care how fat they say I am, how ugly bald people are. I don't care. Because that does not affect me. My my self-confidence, my self-worth does not depend on whether or not somebody
somebody else talks nice to me. Now, you start throwing stuff at me and you got another problem, right? You're, you're right to say whatever you want to say is uh, the free speech. I mean, you, as long as what you're saying does not endanger public safety, like if somebody jumped up here and yelled fire and everybody started stampeding out of here and some people got trampled and they laughed and said, oh, I was just kidding. Well, no, now, now you're going to jail because some people got hurt because of what you did, right? That's different. That's culpability for what you said causing harm, right? Actual physical harm, not emotional harm. Right? So, uh, doing what the Bible says, stating that someone has done wrong, and providing proof that it's wrong, is not hate speech. It's hating every false way. It's hating the works of iniquity. But it's... it's it's not malicious intent to hurt someone. It's actually leading into our next point. John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit came, He would convict the world of sin. That's the same word. Where it says expose them, same word. Well, the Holy Spirit does that through the written word. Through the, through the inspired word that was given through the apostles. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. They were convinced there, same word for expose or rebuke. So what was Paul telling Timothy to do? Tell people what is wrong. Tell people if they're engaged in wrong activity, tell them and tell them why it's wrong. Convince them. Convict them. Reprove them. Right? Give the, give, the, give the evidence. Give the proof. Titus chapter 1, beginning verse 13 says, This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply. Well, that's hate speech. Now you're not just talking about rebuking me. You're doing it sharply. That's hate speech. If that was hate speech, then every kid in the world could have their parents arrested for hate speech. Because every kid... Unless they're a total monster because nobody's ever disciplined them. Right? That you can tell the kids who haven't been rebuked sharply because they're the ones throwing spaghetti on the people at the table next to them, at the restaurant. Right? Every kid that is a well behaved child that knows how to behave has been rebuked sharply at times. That wasn't hate speech. That was done because somebody loved them enough to want to mold them into a responsible person. Right? So Paul says, Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. And so we've got how to hate by exposing error. See, we're hating the error. Now, is it going to offend some people? Yeah, those who are involved in the error. Is it going to step on some toes? Yeah. You know, sometimes I need somebody to step on my toes. Sometimes exactly what I need is for somebody to come to me and so that I'll say, oh, I shouldn't have had my foot there. Right? That's when your toes get stepped on. It's when your foot is where it's not supposed to be. Right? So sometimes we need our feet stepped on. We hate by exposing error. And I know you look at this and you say, well, Norm, now you've totally gone crazy. We hate by loving enough to hate. See, that's, that's an oxymoron, right? That's a paradox where you say, well, that, that's self-contradictory. Well, actually it's not. Not when you understand the biblical principle we're talking about of hating every false way, of hating the works of iniquity, of hating uh, a person being involved in that. In the sense that, that we have an aversion to it. And, and because... If somebody I love is involved in something that causes me to go, you, and to not want to be around them, I love that person. I don't want them engaged in something that causes me to recoil from them and causes me to, to not want them around me. So I'm going to love that person enough to do what we've been talking about.
talking about? To share the precepts of God, the, the, the right way. To expose the error that they're involved in. Because I love them enough to express the hate that will help them come out of that. That will help get, the, get them out of that. Right? By loving them enough to hate. We already looked at Luke 14, 26. About hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also. Now, it, it should be clear enough by, by who's involved there, father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, that those are people that we love. We love those people. They're our family. They're close to us. We love them. We have an affection for them. And so because I love them, I'm going to do everything in my power to express the hate for what keeps us separate, for what causes friction, for what robs us of peace. I love them enough to hate. I love them enough to show that we can't have a normal relationship because of this. And, and if you want to have a normal relationship with me, you've got to get rid of this because I hate that. And as long as you're involved in that, I don't want you around. Because if we love them enough, we'll do that. Right? Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Isn't that the principle here? Loving enough to hate? Now, is Paul telling the congregation in Corinth to hate this young man, to hate this man, and get rid of him and tell him, get out of here and don't ever come back? No, that's not what he says. Now, was it hurtful? You, you read 2 Corinthians, this is part of the Bible class this week. You read 2 Corinthians, yes, it was very hurtful. It was devastating. Why did they do it? Why did they do this thing that expressed hatred for what he was involved in? Because they love him. And Paul says, as long as you are tolerating him, uh, sitting there in the congregation, as long as you're not exposing it for what it is, you're not loving him. If you want to love him, you need to take the drastic measure to show him how severe his condition is. You have to love enough to hate. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That sounds like uh, pretty harsh, doesn't it? That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, out of concern for who is the hatred for the person being expressed? It's out of concern for Him. It's out of concern for Him. We love you. We care about you. But this that you're involved in cannot be tolerated. You've got to go. They loved Him enough to hate. They loved Him enough to hate the error. We are not expressing love to someone when we tolerate their error. We're not showing the love of Christ to a person that we tolerate being in sin and being lost. How, how could we possibly think that we're doing the loving thing by smiling at someone and telling them how great they are, how special they are, how wonderful they are? Don't worry about anything. You know, this thing, don't, don't, don't feel bad about that. It's okay. You're just a wonderful person. How in the world could we think that that is the loving thing to do for that person when it's going to cause them to go to hell? And we're just going to smile at them all the way to hell. That is not the loving thing to do. The loving thing to do is to say, I hate that that you're involved in. I hate it, and as long as you're involved in that, I can't have anything to do with you. I love you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want us to be uh, in a normal relationship, but this thing that you're involved in, I can't, I can't abide that. And it breaks my heart. See, that's what we were talking about this morning in the Bible class, the sorrowful letter. Why was it sorrowful? Because it, it broke some people's hearts that they had to take these drastic measures for someone that they love. 
We have to love enough to hate. So, are you hating every false way? Are you hating the works of iniquity? Are you loving your friends and neighbors enough to explain to them why you hate those things? Because if we really love the precepts of God, then we're going to want more people to abide by the precepts of God. If we really love them, we're going to explain to them why the things that they're involved in are, are things that, that we have such an aversion to that we don't want around us. And that's not hate speech, that's love speech. That's, that's speaking the truth in love, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. That's what speaking the truth in love means. It means you love that person enough to tell them even the hard truth. If you've not obeyed the gospel this evening by believing in Christ as the Son of God, repenting of your sins and confessing that you believe Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ have your sins washed away by His blood, then we pray that you would make a decision to do that this very evening. Because until you have done that, you cannot be in a right relationship with God. Or if having done that, if you have been separated from Christ because of tolerance for the world, because of tolerance for sin, then we pray that you would repent of those things because we cannot enjoy a right relationship in Christ until those things have been taken away. We love you enough to tell you the truth. Won't you come, won't you stand